Good morning, everyone. I'd like to invite everybody to uh, turn to our seats. I love our church. I love you guys. I love looking out and, and seeing everybody fellowshipping and talking and loving one another. It brings joy to my heart. Well, if you're new with us this morning, we have been studying the book of Ephesians, although this, this week we want to take a break uh, for the next couple of weeks from, uh, from the book of Ephesians. So we're going to be in the Gospel of John this morning. If you don't have a Bible with you this morning, uh, there are Bibles in the back. There's a table back there by the door that has some paperback Bibles, uh, both in English and Spanish, and we're on page 576 in the paperback version of our Bible. If you don't own a Bible, we'd love to make that our gift to you, by the way, so... Uh, please take that. And be. So we're going to be in the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. This is the word of the Lord. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God." And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen His glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. May God bless the reading and the preaching of His Word. Well, if you had to guess what was the most shocking section of Scripture, what are the most shocking words of Scripture, what would your mind raise to? So there's a lot of bits that we could go to depending on what you consider shocking, right? For the first century Jew, these words that we just read would be shocking. They would rank among the highest of the most shocking words that they would ever re read. To, to speak of God Almighty, the idea that Yahweh himself would take on flesh, well, this was considered blasphemy. The incarnation of Christ, what we celebrate at Christmas, the incarnation of Christ is God's greatest wonder, one that no creature could ever have imagined. It has rightly been called the miracle of all miracles. Here, says J.I. Packer, are two mysteries for the price of one. We have the plurality of persons within the unity of God and the union of Godhead and manhood in the person of Jesus. It is here in the thing that happened at the first Christmas that the most profound and unfathomable depths of the Christian revelation lie. The Word became flesh. God became human. The Divine Son became a Jew. The Almighty appeared on earth as a helpless baby, unable to do more than lie there and stare and wriggle and make noises, needing to be fed and clothed and changed need to be taught to talk like any other child. And there was no illusion or deception in this. The babyhood of the Son of God was a reality. The more you think about it, the more you ponder this, the more staggering it gets. Nothing in fiction is, a, is as fantastic as the truth of the incarnation. The Almighty God, a child, blasphemy to the Jewish ear. And yet this this is the theology of Christmas. This is what we celebrate. And the thing is, once, that, once we grant the divinity of Jesus, once we grant that Jesus was divine, 
any other challenge that we have, any other challenge that we come with, with the resurrection, with the atonement, or, or the miracles of Jesus, well, they all fall to the wayside. Because if Jesus is God, well, then everything else that the New Testament contains, it all, it all makes sense. And this is why so much is at stake in what we believe about Christmas, what we believe about the coming of Christ. You see, apart from the incarnation of Christ, there is no atonement of Christ. There is no resurrection of Christ. There is no glory eternal with Christ. But with the incarnation, we receive everything. If I could sum it up in one sentence with the, with the Apostle John is communicating here. The incarnation displays the glory of Christ and demands the adoration of his people. That's it. The incarnation displays the glory of Christ and demands the adoration of his people. That's the theology of Christmas. That's what John is teaching us here in this passage as he reveals who Jesus is and why he came. So whether you've known Jesus for decades and, th and this is, this is you know, something that you've read and studied for years or if you're coming this morning and, and you've got questions about him you're not sure, maybe you're here because somebody invited you against your will, we want to pray this morning that God would help us through his word to see his glory, to see him for his worth. We want to ask the spirit of God to help us to see the glory of Christ and that it would lead us to treasure him afresh in a deeper and a more significant way. And as we do this, we, we are going to read a large section of scripture. And I had somebody before the meeting say, wow, that's, that's a lot to cover. I'm going to focus on the first and the last verse. So this is not a typical expositional message that we typically preach. We went through the Gospel of John line by line, section by section, earlier this year. And so, so I'd encourage you to, you know, we have those messages online for the entire section. We did this in multiple messages. But this morning we want to focus on the first and the last verse. And we're going to see three implications of the incarnation to show why it displays the glory of Christ and why it demands the adoration of his people. So first we see that Jesus Christ is fully God. Verse 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John starts, think about the way that Matthew starts his gospel, the way that Luke starts his gospel. They start you know, with, the, with the physical birth of Christ. Uh, and so they, they start there. And yet, what does John do? John goes beyond that. John goes to eternity past because that is where the story of Jesus begins. The story of Jesus did not start 2,000 years ago. Eternity past is where Jesus was. And so that's where John draws our attention. So not to the manger in Bethlehem, but in the beginning was the word. He places Jesus where we expect to place God in the beginning. And therefore, right off the bat, John is identifying Jesus as the eternal God. Mark Johnson, a, um, a pastor and a Bible commentator, says, Without apology or qualification, John goes back in time beyond Bethlehem where Jesus was born and Nazareth where he was conceived, indeed back beyond the beginning of time itself, and allows us a glimpse of a glorious person who has an eternal existence. So John starts off his book teaching the full deity of Christ right out, right out of the gate. No, you know, no dancing around it. When creation was made, Jesus, the word, already was. The, cre the word existed before creation, which makes it clear that the word was not created. He's not in the created order. Jesus was not created. He always was with God. If the word was already in the beginning, then he must either have been with God or he must have been God. And John here seems to teach both. Because in this one verse, he says the word was with God. And the word was God. So the, per so the word is a person who has a relationship with God. So we see that right off the bat. So you can, you can have sympathy with the view that, that he was separate from God. Throughout the creation account, though, in Genesis, which these words echo in the beginning, we see that God spoke the world into creation by his word. We see that the word is God's create agent in creation, accomplishing his will. Psalm 33, 6 says, By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. 
Psalm 107 verse 20 says, He sent out his word and healed them and delivered them from their destruction. So the word who made creation also brings about God's salvation. The word is God's agent. With this in mind, we see that John wants us to understand not only the divinity, the eternality of the word, but also his full personhood, that he's a person. The word is a person, a companion of God himself. The doctrine of the, of the Trinity states this. In the unity of the Godhead, there are three persons. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Now certainly it's hard to understand how there can only be one God and three persons in that God. But it's verses like this that, that cause us to believe it. It's not something that, that we invented you know, to, you know, to make sense of something. It's that we see it taught in Scripture. Some people today deny that there are these distinct persons. So that there are some, there are pastors and theologians of big churches out there who would deny this. Instead, seeing the Father and the Son and the Spirit as different modes of one God. And so they would, they would see it as different manifestations. So what they would say is, they would say, God reveals himself at times as our Father. At other times, God reveals himself or manifests himself as the Son. And other times, God manifests himself as the Spirit. This, if you want a, a name for that, that's called modalism. And it is heresy. And you see it taught, you see it explicitly denied throughout Scripture. You see, the logic of it doesn't make sense because while one person can be by himself, he's never with himself. It would be odd for me to say, uh, I and myself went to the store yesterday. I was with myself when I brushed my teeth this morning. And so, so the logic of it is silly. And then you see it explicitly denied in Scripture. You see the baptism of Jesus, the, the presence of, the God, of God the Father and the Son, and then the, the ascension of the Spirit all in the same place. At the same time, three distinct persons and yet one God. So we see, the, so we see this in, in God. And then in, in Jesus, we see his full deity. Verse 1 teaches that he is fully divine. Years ago, there was a, a very popular book that came out. Uh, some of you may have read it. Uh, I did not read it. I'm not, I'm not against the book. Uh, but a number of my uh, family members read it. And in, this book taught the idea. Uh, it wasn't original to this book. But they put forth the idea that Christians never even considered Jesus to be God until the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD. AD in, until the 4th century. So they say... For the first several hundred years, Christians didn't even consider Jesus as Christ. That's a, that's a, that's a uh, production of our modernity. Um, but here in clear language in verse 1, the Apostle John writes, the word was God. So it, it's, it's just nonsense to say that Christians didn't believe this from the, from the beginning. He repeats it again in verse 18 and then again at the end of the gospel. You remember what happens when, uh, when Jesus comes face to face with, with Thomas the Apostle? Doubting Thomas the skeptic. Thomas confesses with his mouth and falls down before Jesus, saying, my Lord and my God. This is the Christian confession. And this is what John wants us to know right from the beginning of his gospel. That Jesus Christ, the word, is fully God. Now because of how clearly John 1 teaches the full deity of Christ. Those who are opposed to the deity of Christ have long attacked this. It began with this man named Arius uh, in the third century and it continues on today. Maybe, um, you know, I, I live here you know, just down the street in Round Rock and uh, in my neighborhood, we get regular visits from, uh, from members of the Mormon church and the Jehovah's Witnesses. Now, I don't know what your thought is when you see these people coming down the street. If you turn off the lights and, and draw the curtains and, and hope they don't knock on your door. Um, just this week, one of my sons came running in the house saying, Daddy, the, the Mormons are coming. The Mormons are coming. Get ready. <laughs> it's an event for us of anticipation. The world comes to us. We don't have to go out into the world as missionaries. They come to us and, and, they, and they want to talk about the gospel. And so we invite them in. We invite them for meals. We, you know, uh, we engage them in dialogue. I, I love these times. And, and the, the thing about the, the Mormons in particular is that they cycle through regularly. Uh, I've got friends in the Mormon church. Um, and they, you know, these missionaries are young guys that are you know, usually out on a two-year, three-year mission. 
and they'll come here. For some reason, this tends to be, for whatever reason, the ward that's down the street, that's the name of what they call their churches, um, for some reason, that's like the last stop for them. So every time they come to my house, the first, time I, the first thing I ask them is, you know, how long have you been on mission? And they always say, oh, okay, I'm, I'm on my last, you know, two months. So I have a short time frame with them, so I get right to the point. And then two months later, I've got a new set of Mormon missionaries that come to my door. It's, it's great. It's a wonderful, wonderful deal. Well, the, the Jehovah's Witnesses, they teach similarly to what Arius taught. Um, what they teach is not that Jesus is God, but rather that he is God-like. So they, they would, they would t take this very differently. They argue this because in the final phrase of verse 1, where it says the word was with God and the word was God, in the Greek, there's no definite article there. Okay? And so, uh, so what they argue is that, is that our translation shouldn't say the word was God. It should say the word was a God. Uh, there's no, now, th to be clear, there's no indefinite article. Okay, so the definite article, the indefinite article, a. Um, there's no indefinite article either. There's a definite article before the word and then nothing before God. So they would say, should be the word was a God. Um, so how do we respond to that? They pull out their New World Translation. They pull out their translation of the scriptures that say that in black and white. And they say, see right here, it says the word was a God. So Jesus is not God. And for them, that's, that's the crusher. Well, for the, uh, the way that we respond to this is, first off, we, you know, we want to recognize that the deity of Christ is not dependent upon a single verse. There's no one verse that we look to. This is a, certainly a wonderful, gloriously majestic text that explicitly teaches the deity of Christ. But it's taught throughout the Gospel of John, taught throughout the Scripture. So we don't look to this one verse alone. And secondly, even if we want to look to this one verse, I'm happy to go there with the Jehovah's Witnesses. So, so while for, for folks who are not familiar, who you don't do your devotions in the Greek New Testament every morning, and that's me, I don't do that. Um, but for those of us who, who Greek might be a little bit foreign and they want to argue Greek and they want to sound sophisticated and say, well, in the Greek, which you don't know and you don't have a Greek Testament, so I can argue this, uh, there's no definite article and therefore it should be translated the word was a God. But if you know just a little bit of Greek, and that's what I know, I know a little bit of Greek, Greek doesn't require you to have a definite article every single time, especially when the words are, are put together this way. They, it's associated, there's a, uh, it's a distributive definite article so that it, uh, when you say the word was God, the applies to both. The word was God. So it's common for a definite article to serve both nouns and so the gra grammatical argument is simply wrong. Thirdly, if John wanted to say that the word was a God, the word that he used there is theos. Okay, so theos is God Almighty. Okay, so it refers to God. If he wanted to say God-like, there's a perfectly good alternate word that he could have used, and he didn't. So, so the argument that they bring is, is, is just wrong on every count. Fourth, there's an obvious reason why the, for the way that John wrote the sentence. John's point is both to identify the word as God, but also, and this is important, as distinct from God the Father. So if John said, if John included a definite article before God, what he would have been saying was, the word was the God. And therefore, he would be identifying Jesus with God in a way that would be indistinguishable. Therefore, denying the personhood, the separate personhood of the members of the Trinity. And so his point is clearly to specify Christ's deity as God the Son while also distinguishing his personhood from God the Father. Martin Luther, famous reformer, says this about this, this passage. Martin Luther says, This text is a strong and valid attestation of the divinity of Christ. Everything depends upon this doctrine. It serves to maintain and support all of the doctrines of our Christian faith. Therefore, the devil assailed it very early in the history of Christendom, and he continues to do so in our day. John begins his gospel explicitly teaching the full deity of Christ in his relationship to God the Father, insisting on the divine sonship of Jesus for our salvation. So Jesus is doing the will of the Father within the perfect harmony of the Trinity. Arthur Pink, 
Another famous theologian put it this way. He says, the one who was heralded by the angels to the Bethlehem shepherds, who walked this earth for 33 years, who was crucified at Calvary and who rose in triumph from the grave, and who 40 days later departed from these scenes, was none other than the Lord of glory. The gospel begins at that point where John wants us to end with an understanding that Jesus is fully God. That leads us to our second point. So Jesus is fully God, and he's fully man. Verse 14, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. This sentence, this statement, is one of the most pregnant, one of the most significant, one of the most memorable lines in Scripture ever written. And the implications of this sentence, of this statement, of Holy Scripture, are limitless. It has provided the church over the centuries with a key to understanding the mystery of Jesus Christ. It represents the heart and the climax of the gospel. The rest of John's gospel is simply explaining and unpacking the truth of this verse. Here we see Jesus appear one with the Father, both in his divinity, but now also one with us in our full humanity. The Westminster Confession of Faith says the Son of God, being very and eternal God, did, when the fullness of time was come, take upon him man's nature, with all the essential properties and common infirmities thereof, yet without sin. Christ's incarnation means that the, uh, that the Son of God became human in the fullest sense, without losing any of his divinity. Jesus is sinless without losing any of his humanity. So he's fully God and fully man. He's not less God or less man. He is uncorrupted, true humanity and all glorious, full divinity. Now, the word that he chooses here, he doesn't say the word took on a body, uh, the word became a human, um, or became a man, but he says the word became flesh. Now, the, the word flesh here is a, it's a startling word choice. Um, it's, flesh stands for the, the, for the whole person. It refers to, to human existence in total, in its frailty, in its vulnerability. Jesus identifies with us to that degree. You think of the verses in Hebrews that, that speak of Jesus being able to identify us and sympathize with us in our weakness because he knows the weakness of our flesh. He knows the frailty of our humanity. The word translated flesh has a, it has a certain earthiness about it that, that seems alien, that seems foreign that, uh, to, the to the glory that belongs to the Son of God. And it's for that very reason that John uses that word to drive home his point. God created Adam from the dust of the earth and then he breathed life into him. Not just physical life, but spiritual life. The creator of all things bent down and pressed his face into the face of his creation that he formed from the dust of the earth. And he breathes into it, making something uniquely human. Given that one of the main threads of Old Testament teaching is that sin has seriously impaired our humanity as creatures made in the image of God, the gospel in the New Testament announces the, the recovery of our humanity in the incarnation of Jesus Christ. He takes on flesh, real human flesh. But he does so in a way that breaks our chain of fallenness that, that our race has shared since the, since the sin of Adam. So if our fallen nature has reduced us to uh, the equivalent of, um, of spiritual beggars digging through the bins of life for scraps of spiritual food, all of which leaves us empty, Jesus Christ is the one in whom the full dignity of our humanity is restored. It is one of the most thrilling facets of the gospel in an age when human degradation and worthlessness seems to be sinking lower to the depths than, e than ever could be imagined. And when emptiness brokenness is common to every life, Jesus brings true hope. God the Son, <clears throat> bring the fullness that we so desperately need for and long for in life, he brings us the hope, the fulfillment of a fulfilled and, and restored humanity. Without ceasing for a moment to be divine, Jesus has united to himself a full human nature, 
and become an authentic human person. God with us. Emmanuel. What we just sang. Emmanuel. God with us. God made man in Jesus Christ. C.S. Lewis calls this the grand miracle. Edward Caswell said, Lo, within a manger lies he who built the starry skies. Think about that. Lo, within a manger lies he who built the starry skies. It's unfathomable to think about God Almighty in, 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 a, in a manger, in a, in a baby. Graham Cole, a uh, theologian who wrote a phenomenal work of biblical theology on the doctrine of incarnation, uh, says this. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. God stooped. God revealed himself as Emmanuel, God with us. In the Old Testament, in Genesis 6, God grieved over wayward humankind. In the New Testament, we saw how Christ wept human tears at the tomb of Lazarus. He is the window into the heart of God. To hear Jesus is to hear the word of God. To see Jesus is to see the character of God. To watch Jesus in action is to see God in action. God no longer simply told us about himself. He, he didn't even simply show us by his actions, but he came himself. He walked among us. We saw the invisible God in a human body. Well, among the multitude of implications that we could spend months or years talking about, Jesus' incarnation, I want to point to two things. His salvation, and his identification. Our sin and fallenness imply that we simply cannot save ourselves. We all know this. We all know that we can't be good enough to earn the favor of God. There is no balancing the scales that we can do. If we worked the rest of our lives giving ourselves away, we, we couldn't do it. Only God can save us. The coming of God in the flesh, though, does not save us in and of itself. The incarnation simply leads to and points to the death of the God-man, which is also required, as John makes clear later. The incarnation establishes the necessary precondition for our salvation. It brings the healing of the great divide between God and his rebellious creatures into the realm of true possibility. In becoming one of us, Jesus Christ is fitted to act on our behalf as mediator and redeemer. How, how insane is it? Think about it. Think about it. That God Almighty, who's, who's existed from eternity past, takes on flesh. He puts on flesh and blood. He steps out of the most privileged place, heaven. He begins to walk and to dwell among us, knowing who we are, knowing our hearts. There's nothing in your past or present that you have done. There's no thought that you've had that God is not fully aware of. You haven't surprised him. God has not, he hasn't called a holy huddle with the, with the Trinity trying to figure out uh, what to do about, your, about you and your depravity. He knows you. The whole point of God, of Jesus coming with grace and truth instead of more law is because it was made er evident early on that the law doesn't help us receive salvation. The law doesn't, doesn't get us to a place in and of ourselves. We can't make enough sacrifices on our own. There's always another sacrifice needed. It doesn't cleanse us the way that we need in our souls. In Genesis 1 and 2, there's one rule. Remember it? Hey, don't touch that. One rule. God says, everything that I have is yours. Here's a wife. Enjoy. Here's food. Enjoy. You have dominion over all the earth. All of it. Just don't touch this. And how long does that last? With one rule, we just couldn't help ourselves when we blow the whole thing up. One rule. You had one job. <laughs> We're unable. So Jesus comes with truth and grace, forgiveness of our sins. He humbles himself. He takes on flesh. And he forgives us of our sins. He dwells among us. Us, his enemies. Us, his enemies, who have daily rebelled against him, who have daily decided to be our own authority instead of making God the authority in our lives. And yet he comes to us. He gives us grace, redemption, salvation. He also identifies with us. 
in the incarnation, God Almighty identifies with us in our human life, in our weakness, in our frailty, in our suffering. Any other religion in the world, there is no parallel to the sympathetic presence of God in our weakness. To God sharing in Christ the struggle of human life with us. Here in the gospel, the gospel speaks with universal relevance for the simple fact is for the great mass of humanity that life is hard. And it's here. It's here in the, in the hardness of life. In the pain and the difficulty of our, of our brief time on earth. That God walks with us. That God dwells with us. It's here that Jesus says to us in Matthew 11, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. This is what God does for us. He identifies with us in our suffering, in the physical pain in your body. In the ache in your soul, he sustains us. He gives us grace. He strengthens us. With us in our, in our temptation, Jesus Christ came into the world to free us from our sin. He came to walk with us in our sojourning. He sends his spirit to be with us. He gives us new mercies every morning. He is present to help the broken and to bring light in the darkness. And this leads to our final point. The incarnation displays the glory of Christ and it demands our adoration. Our adoration. The greatness of this truth of the incarnation assaults our mind and staggers our imagination. But that very fact also drives us to our knees in worship. Hymn writer B.R. Hanby says, Who is he in yonder stall, at whose feet the shepherds fall? Tis the Lord, a wondrous story. Tis the Lord, the King of glory. At his feet we humbly fall. Crown him, crown him, Lord of all. John's language here in verse 14, we have seen his glory. Glory is of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. This reflects the events of the exodus from Egypt. Makes us think of the revelation of God at Mount Sinai. We think about the tabernacle in the wilderness, all of which dominated the faith of Israel in times past. As God lived among his people then, so the word has come to live among us now. Just as the people in the Old Testament had seen God's glory manifested in tabernacle and temple, so now God's glory is revealed in his coming in person as Jesus, fully God and fully man. The danger of, of studying doctrine, right, is that we can become stale and, and, um, and you know, filled with knowledge but empty and void of, of love, of faith, of the hope that, that the Spirit gives us. Jesus warns of those who would know much of God, but who never knew God. Frightening warnings. The doctrine of Christ and the doctrine of the Incarnation are no exceptions to this. A man named Melanchthon wrote a very long time ago that we do better Listen, we do better to adore the mysteries of deity than to investigate them. What he went on to say was that a man may be an expert on the incarnation and yet be totally lacking in faith and love. Ours is a God to be worshipped, not a, not a subject to be dissected and studied merely. Now this is not, this is not an argument against study. If you come into my home, you will see books everywhere, in piles. Uh, I'm a fan of study. I, I encourage study. Um, the Bible calls us to study, to love the Lord our God with all our mind as well as our soul. But the, the other danger is that, is that there are many, uh, just as there's a, there are many who can have great knowledge of creeds and doctrines and yet be lacking in love and faith, um, he also warns of those who, who, are, who are empty in their, in their heads, who are, it's just a... Um, an emotional response, purely. But, but where Jesus puts the emphasis, remember, remember whose faith he commended? Remember whose faith he commended? He said, like the little children, unless you believe like the little children. Not like the Pharisees. The Pharisees had memorized large portions of Scripture, and I am memorizing large portions of Scripture with you guys right now. So I commend that. We want to do that. But we always want to make sure that that what we are doing is continually cultivating a sense of wonder and awe. 
our response to God is not simply study, but adoration and exaltation. We want to, we want to rejoice. If your study doesn't drive you to your knees to sing out with Hanby, um, crown him, crown him Lord of all. If it doesn't drive you to sing out when we're singing, when Rob's up here leading us in song and there's, and there's no life in you singing out from experience, check that. What's, go, what's going on there? What's going on? We want to cultivate that wonder and awe before God. You know who never glories in their doctor? Healthy people. Last week, I was, um, I was playing around like I'm still younger than I am. My, uh, my, old, my two older sons and I, um, we wrestle, we, we, we train in jujitsu, and um, they're younger and more pliable than I am. And so Tuesday morning, I was, I was, I was with this, there's a guy there, there's a, he's a wrestler, and I had a, um, a dominant position on him. And so I was kind of on him on the ground, and I, I felt like he was about to tap, and I, he, I don't think he thought he was about to tap, and he wrapped up his legs around my leg, around my knee, and he started flexing. Now, I wasn't worried about it until I heard a loud pop. So I said, okay, now, let's stop. That's new. <laughs> Hang on a second. So I kind of kind of limped off and felt OK. It didn't hurt. Um, my leg was unstable. It was kind of wobbly. Um, but I felt OK. So I, I thought, maybe it's, like, maybe it's like when you crack your knuckles. Uh, so I sat out for a few minutes. I got back on the mat. I went, I went and, and started you know, going again. I, I grabbed him. I tried to do a judo throw. I put my leg here. It popped again, and it went down. It's out. <laughs> It's like, again, no pain. I wasn't sure what was going on. Um, and so I talked to my wife about it. And in her wisdom, she directs me to a doctor. <laughs> so I go to the doctor. And the doctor says, man, I'm, I'm concerned about something. I mean, he does all these tests. There's no, there's no pain going on. Um, I couldn't bend my leg very much. Uh, but um, he orders an x-ray, no broken bones. So he sent me to an orthopedic specialist. So I go see him Wednesday. The orthopedic specialist says, oh, man, I, as, he, as he's examining my leg. He says, I'm, I'm not sure, but I'm concerned about your ACL. So let's get an MRI. So I get an MRI. And I'm sitting in this loud machine where it's got, have you ever had an MRI? There's this loud knock, 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 knock for 20 minutes. And I know that that's a short MRI. And that there, you know, some of you may have had longer MRIs where you're in there for an hour. And so there's a loud knocking in this machine that I don't see it doing anything. I just hear it knocking. Uh, and so <laughs> I'm not really sure what's going on, but I get out of there, and the doctor calls me the next day and confirms, yes, you tore your ACL. You tore your meniscus as well. You require surgery. It's going to take a year before you can re-engage in activity the way that you thought, the way that you have been doing. And so something weird the last few days is I've been trying to comprehend this, I've been dealing with this, I've been uh, looking for help, uh, calling out to friends and, and people in my gym asking, okay, now, who's done this before? What's that like? And, and every one of them had stories for those who, who have done this. And it's apparently, it's not like totally common, but it happens regularly. Uh, so I found a number of, of um, compadres, if you will, in this. And, and they, they were all glorying in their doctors. They were all talking about, well, I have this doctor, and he needed this. I have this physical therapist, and he was wonderful this way. And they were all talking about the doctors praising them for how they helped them, how they feel stronger than they did before. So wh why were these guys glorying their doctors? Because something was wrong that they couldn't fix. Something's wrong with me that I can't fix. There's no, uh, unless I'm wrong, and come grab me after service if you know about something, but I don't think that there's a pill that I can take to make this better. I don't think that there's an oil I can put on my leg that will heal it. <laughs> um, somebody's going to need to cut open my knee and take pieces of a cadaver and put them in my knee to make it work right again, to make me be able to bend it rightly again and be able to run again. And I can't do that by myself. The other guys couldn't do it on their own. And so we thank God for the, we praise him for the common grace, for steady hands of doctors, for MRI machines, for x-ray machines, for, for all the things that God has gifted men and women to do in his kindness that he used to miraculously heal messed up knees and do far greater things, save lives. 
as well. So I will glory in my doctors with great joy because I tore my ACL and I don't have a clue as to what to do about it. You know what you don't care about? Orthopedic surgeons. You probably don't have one. Maybe some of you do. For those of you who do, you, you understand what I'm talking about. At some point this week, most of you will probably not say, hey, Dr. Driscoll is awesome. But I am. I am thanking God this week for my doctor. <sighs> when you're healthy, you don't glory in what heals you. But when you know you're broken, that's what drives you to glory in the solution to that. When you know you're broken in your sin, that's when you glory in your Savior. Until sin is bitter, grace will not be sweet. Well, sin is bitter. Every one of us stand before God as broken sinners. And we know this. We can't make it right on our own. The theology of Christmas is that in the midst of that brokenness, in the midst of that sin, there is hope for redemption, for a ruined humanity, hope of pardon, hope of peace with God, hope for glory with, for eternity at Jesus' right hands. Because at the Father's will, Jesus Christ became poor, was, took on flesh, was born in a stable so that 30 years later, he could go to a cross, hang there, being mocked by the very people that he came to save, so that he could provide salvation and redemption for a broken and helpless people. That's you and me. And that is worthy of our adoration. John Murray, Bible commentator, says this. The infinite became finite. The eternal and supertemporal entered time and became subject to its conditions. The immutable became mutable. The invisible became visible. The creator became the created. The sustainer of all became dependent. The almighty infirm. All is summed up in the proposition, God became man. Doxology is the appropriate response and also the cultivation of a sense of wonder at what God has done in the past and will do in the world to come. Our response to the incarnation is one of adoration. So that's what we want to do this week. And this time of year, this is a, it's a tricky time of the year because a lot of us, Christmas, it's not all joy. The holidays are not all laughter and happiness. A lot of us, there, is, um, there are financial realities that make Christmas a season that you, you feel like you're failing your kids and your family. Some of us have lost family members, and this is a difficult season because what you're most aware of is that, is that they're not there. They're not going to be there Friday morning with you. It's difficult because uh, this is a season often for families, and, and maybe your family isn't exactly a Norman Rockwell painting. Maybe you're single and, and longing to be with someone, even if it's not Norman Rockwell-esque. And this is where Jesus comes into our world. He comes in and he sympathizes with us in our weakness, in our suffering, in our pain, in our vulnerability. He is with us. He is Emmanuel, God with us here too, especially here. And so he wants you to bring him your suffering, bring him your pain, bring him your struggle, your questions. Give him your anxieties, your desires. He is your heavenly father, and he came into this world to display his glory for your good. Listen, God wants more for you this year, more for you this week than to think of a cute manger scene. Manger scenes are good. We want to think about that. We want to celebrate what happened at that manger. I went to, there's a, there's a church north of here that, that puts on a, a live play, an interactive um, deal. I don't know what you call it. It's not a play, but, but an interactive deal where they, they reenact what Bethlehem was like when Jesus was born. And there's, and there's people that are running around um, celebrating and saying, did you hear the Savior has come? There's a, I was with, he's dressed as a shepherd. He says, I was with my brothers in the field and the Savior has come. The angels revealed themselves, you know, came and said that he's there to follow that star and he's there. The Messiah has come. And we, and we do that and we celebrate that. And so we, you know, one of the traditions in my family is we have this, uh, we have a manger, like this little, you know, two foot wide, you know, one foot, you know, or, or two foot long, one foot wide manger that we put under the tree. And Christmas morning, 
uh, we get excited and we come downstairs and we have a baby lying in the manger. Not my, not my real baby. We didn't leave him there overnight, so don't, don't get up in arms. Um, so, it's, so it's good to celebrate that. It's good to think about what happened there. But it's not simply that. God wants us to stand in awe of what happened there, of the fullness of what the incarnation presents. He wants us to grasp the fact that all we need for life and salvation is provided for us through Jesus, God become man. The Apostle John shows us Jesus, not with glory veiled and his true identity concealed, but as he really is, the infinite God who stepped into human flesh, into our finite world, taking upon himself the flesh of our humanity. And this is the glory of God on full display. This, the theology of Christmas, is not simply a baby in a manger, but the fact that the God of all creation sent his only son to humble himself, to take on human flesh, real weakness, that he condescended to us for our redemption. And he did all this fully with the end in view of living a life being mocked, misunderstood, taking the low road, humbling himself as the point of, as the, as the text of Philippians 2 says us, tells us, humbling himself even to the point of death, even a criminal's death on a cross. And so church, listen, this, this is for you, for me, for every person who had put their hope and their confidence in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, who is the image of the invisible God, the radiance of his glory, the exact imprint of his nature, who upholds the universe with the word of his power. He is the holy and righteous one, the author of life, the Lord of glory, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Jesus Christ is word become flesh. Emmanuel, God with us. This, friends, is Jesus Christ. This church is your God. Come, let us adore him, Christ our Lord. Please join me in prayer. Well, Almighty God, we thank you for this time. We thank you for your word. We thank you for, for this season, Father that we celebrate the incarnation, the theology of Christmas, God become man for the purpose of our redemption, calling for our adoration. Help us, O Lord. Help us, Father, by your spirit. Do in us what we cannot do. Pierce our hearts, God. Help us this week as we, we're busy with work and getting ready for festivities, we're, we're cleaning our houses or getting ready for a trip. Help us, Father, to slow down and to reflect what is it that we're celebrating. God, let this, Christmas is not a throwaway holiday. It's not old hat. Let, let, let it not be old to us or common to us. Help us, Father, to sing out with our hearts, Jesus is Lord. Crown him with many crowns, for he is worthy of our praise. Help us, God, to worship you to love you with our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And help us to testify to this world, Father. Let others see the joy, the hope that we have, our faith. And let that be beautiful. Let that show Jesus to be glorious to a lost and dying world. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as always, if, um, if we can pray for you, we'd love to do that this morning. Uh, some of our small group leaders will be up front and available to pray. If there's anything at all, um, I'll be available to pray as well. And let me, uh, let me send you out with this this week. 2 Corinthians 13, verse 14. says, The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Feel compelled to tell who is the peace on earth.